Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mint South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mint South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mint South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville. Next to New Knox.com. And by The Flower Pot for over 100 years, offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations knoxvilleflowerpot.com and by viewers like you. Thank you. Coming up on Tennessee Life, we have a special Oktoberfest edition on tap. With nearly 70 craft breweries in Tennessee, the beer business is booming, which is one reason now is the right time to bring World's Fair beer back. A flashback to 1982 Knoxville, with a new recipe inside that iconic can. We realized that people were looking at this as one more souvenir of the fair. And they wanted this souvenir to take with them to keep. And we realized that we had to do something to make this fresh and obviously sell more beer. An accomplished artist with a home brew hobby decided to combine his two passions. I want this to be, as far as I know, the only place in the world where you can come, you can drink beer made in house out of glasses made in house and watch everything being produced. At Schulz Brau Brewing Company, you can enjoy an authentic German beer while sitting in a chair from a Munich beer garden. The owners want to bring their home country's traditions and share them with Tennessee. My goal to with Schultz Pro Brewing here in Knoxville was to bring people a really authentic German traditional beer. There are lots of other breweries out there making IPAs, but we couldn't really find the traditional German lager. So we wanted to make something that's really approachable, easy drinking, that you can drink in a big liter stein, like you know you see in pictures from Oktoberfest, and you just can drink a lot of it without having too much. Those stories next on Tennessee Live. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Tennessee Life. I'm Vicki Lawson. Craft breweries are booming. Tennessee is now home to 66 of them and counting, nearly tripling over the last five years. Today's beer experience goes way beyond popping a top. We start with a beer Knoxville can claim as its own. World's Fair Beer celebrated Knoxville as the host city in 1982 and provided another souvenir. Now it's back with a nostalgic design and a new recipe inside. Rick, what made you want to bring beer to the fair? Vicki, it's kind of an interesting story. My dad was actually a beer wholesaler and he had been a beer wholesaler since the late 40s. And I went to work for them in 1977. So we knew the World's Fair was coming to town and we knew that there were a lot of official things. One of the things was an official beer and we were not that beer distributor. It was Stroh Brewery out of Detroit, Michigan became the official beer of the World's Fair. So we thought, man, is there something we can do? And we were approached by a group of people that had this idea for World's Fair beer and actually had a design similar to the one that's on the table here. And they came to us and they said, hey, would you consider uh, World's Fair beer? So I went to my boss and I, I went to him and I said, what about World's Fair beer? What do you think? And he looked at me in a very business look and he said, well, Rick, if you can pre-sell 10,000 cases, which turned out to be 240,000 cans. And so I took that as a real goal and I got really excited. So I worked with our sales force and we went out there and we pre-sold 10,000 cases. We actually sold more than that. And so that's kind of how we got started. We began distributing World's Fair beer May 1st, 1982. What were the reviews and how did it taste? So, you know, I have a little <laughs> thin skin and, and they, they weren't necessarily great, but at the time I never realized how maybe not great it was until now since we've re 
birthed it. People go, I hope it doesn't taste like it did in 1982. As famous it, as it was for collecting, it was infamous for not tasting the best. And so it's cool now in the craft industry, there's, there's all these wild new recipes and styles of brewing that just makes it really unique. Tell me what it meant to you to see people taste your beer at the fair and their reaction. How did that feel to you? People might have tasted the beer, but if you talk to older Knoxvillians, most of them never even opened one can. They kept them as souvenir items. People were looking at this as one more souvenir of the fair, and they wanted this souvenir to take with them to keep, and we realized that we had to do something to make this fresh. So we came up with nine different can colors so that people could have nine different souvenirs of the fair and obviously sell more beer. Again, people weren't necessarily drinking the beer, they were saving the beer because it was a souvenir of the fair that went along with all the other souvenirs that were offered in the 1982 World's Fair. Rick, what was your favorite design? Toward the end of the World's Fair, obviously football was starting, University of Tennessee football, and we had a person on our staff that was an UT All-American, Doug Atkins, and we actually dedicated our very last can to him. I had to communicate with a can company executive in San Antonio, Texas, and they didn't know UT Orange. So when the cans came from the brewery, they were not UT Orange. They were orange, all right, and it had Doug's name on it, but they weren't UT Orange, and so I was really worried that that can wouldn't sell, even though it was football time, and most of the stores had put us on display, but I was worried because it definitely was not UT Orange. It was more of a dark orange. Why did you want to relaunch it? Here we are, 35 years later, Knoxville is a different place. People are proud to be from Knoxville. People are proud of Knoxville icons, and this is one of those things. The World's Fair is a big icon of Knoxville, a very successful event that happened here, and World's Fair beer was very successful, and it happened in our hometown. So that kind of was behind the relaunch. There's also this, this giant wave of craft beer in America, here in Knoxville even, and so, we thought, we want to hop on board with all of that. It supports all the things that we agree with. We care about Knoxville. Knoxville always supports the home team. They're always very local centric. And the craft market is all about that anyway. So it's not these big national brands. It's, you know, locally sourced businesses and people involved to like all make it happen. And so that's why now really made sense. So in this craft beer boom, you're not just selling beer. You're also selling some nostalgia. Yes. We are. This is kind of me thinking back of what the World's Fair was like. My identity here as I'm drinking this beer is thinking about 1982 a little bit. How would you describe the taste today? So it's got a bit of a malt background going on with it, citrus aroma, and just a little bit of a bite. But amongst our 1982 beer consumers, a lot of hot bitterness is not what they want and so we tried to find a balance in the middle and so you know thus the American Pale Ale and and it's it's done really well for us. Is there anything that you can share with us that we would be surprised to know about the new beer? I don't know if you would be surprised once you saw it but you might see the tap handles have some dings in them and maybe occasionally a little bit of rust and that's because they're made out of the original cans from 1982. We kind of went back and forth on that for a little while and thought about making a Sun Sphere tap handle and all these different things and be injection molded. And then we just thought, I think, Rick, you even had the idea, what if we just use the old cans? And we were like, brilliant, that's a great idea. And it's been really great for us. You know, people walk in and you see all these really ornate, intricate tap handles, but then ours kind of catches your eye because it's so different from the rest and it's just sitting there an old can on the tap line and it kind of speaks to what we've been talking about of being very storied and having nostalgia all wrapped around it. What does it mean to you to see the beer in the stores again 35 years later? I never dreamed that World's Fair beer would ever happen again. You know, it was that, that season when the fair was here because I'll tell you, Vicki, in 1982, the fair ended October 31st, Halloween night, and November 1st, it was like Christmas trees in January. That beer stopped. 
you know, the World's Fair was over. It was time to move on. Everybody had their nine different colors. But seeing it coming back and looking at it at the grocery store, I would go and just act like a, a customer and just walk around and go look at, at the stack in there and seeing the little sign on there and, and watching people look at it. It was, it was just kind of, it was kind of nostalgic and kind of uh, very encouraging to me to see that. Rick and Harrison, thank you for sharing the World's Fair beer story with us. Thank you, Vicki. Thanks, Vicki. Mm -hmm. Later on Tennessee Life, a taste of real German beer brewed behind a castle front, the traditional way with four simple ingredients. But next, the craft of making beer meets the art of making glass. We found a place where you can enjoy a craft brew and a handcrafted glass made right in front of you. Matthew Cummings took his skills as a fine artist and his passion for craft beer and launched the Pretentious Beer and Glass Company. I knew when I came to Knoxville, I wanted to open up a glass blowing studio, which there were none, and we're still the only glass blowing studio downtown, and I wanted to open up a brewery. And at the time, there was only two or three breweries in Knoxville, now there's 11 or 12. And that's also something super exciting about the energy in Knoxville right now. We're experiencing our own craft beer boom. And to be in the middle of that and coming to Knoxville when I did was such perfect timing where I was able to hang out and get to know all of these great brewers when they were still home brewers. Every time. I'm Matthew Cummings. I own Pretentious Beer Company and Pretentious Glass Company. Started those in 2014 in the old city of Knoxville, Tennessee. I want this to be, as far as I know, the only place in the world where you can come, you can drink beer made in house out of glasses made in house and watch everything being produced. You can come in and watch the brewer making the beer. You can come next door, sit at the bar top on the glass side, watch the glass floors making a glass like you're drinking out of. Each side inspires the other. Blow lightly. I grew up in um, Albany, Kentucky, South Central Kentucky, in between Lake Cumberland and Dale Hollow, and I was always really into art, but there wasn't a concept of being an artist, so I didn't know that it was possible. It was something like your crazy aunt did, and literally I had a crazy aunt that everybody thought was an artist just because she's going to be so mad. <laughs> so. So there wasn't a concept of being an artist professionally. It was just something you did as a hobby. I went to Center College, which is a great liberal arts school in central Kentucky. I went there with a little bit of a basketball scholarship, an academic scholarship, and wanted to do something artistic, but something respectable. You know, like in, in the broad sense of the term, just something respectable that was creative. I decided I was going to be um, an architect. So it was a pre-architecture program, and then had to take another medium to get my painting degree. So I took glass, and in that first semester, I absolutely fell in love with the material. Changed my major in one, one semester. Switched off architecture, math, painting, and then went full on glass, because it encapsulated all of these interests that I already had. Glass blowing is team driven. It requires a lot of teamwork and it requires absolute concentration because it's such an unforgiving medium and everything happens so quickly. You're heating the glass, making sure it doesn't break, make sure it doesn't get too hot and at the same time your one hand is keeping it on center because it's constantly falling to the floor. One hey. hand is keeping it on center and then the other oh, hand lightly. you're doing all the shaping. So it's like rubbing your belly and patting your head, you know. And so it requires this level of concentration that feels the same way that playing basketball felt like. And it was this kind of artistic sport. The transition from making sculpture to starting to make the beer glasses, one of the big motivating factors for me behind it was that my sculpture had gotten so expensive that I couldn't afford my own work. My friends couldn't afford my own work and my family members couldn't afford it. Making the beer glasses, I was able to make something that my friends could buy and afford and enjoy, you know, and use every day and have something handmade with its own character and its own soul. 
This glass is where it all started. Yeah, this is the beer glass that started it all. So there was a group of six of us that would get together every Friday and we'd have a bottle share club. So I designed the hoppy glass for my friends and actually cut everyone's fingerprint out of the glass. It took a couple weeks to get everybody coming to the shop so I could engrave their exact handprint. And it fits like a glove. And then when I finally got them all finished, I brought them back to the bottle share and gave, set the glasses out for everyone. They get the glass and they pick it up and they're just like, <laughs> and then one of my friends is like, this is so pretentious. And I still have that memory of my friend talking about how pretentious this was. And eventually I was just like, ah, that's it. I'm just going to call it Pretentious Beer Glass Company. Today, at the moment, we sell 20 different beer glass designs. The dual glass is our most popular beer glass, hands down. And it's one of the first glasses I designed. So this is for a black and tan or a half and half. So I wanted to try to figure out a glass that would make black and tans and half and halves foolproof. So I designed this glass with a divide, a physical divide down the middle that you let you put a beer in one side and a different beer in the other side. And as you drank it, they would mix at the lip. Right before they hit your mouth, they would mix and then would give you the same experience. But a couple of things that I didn't count on that were happy accidents was that since you had the physical divide, you could mix beers that would normally never separate. So we got a patent on this one, a US patent, which I'm really, really proud of. We've sold these glasses to 34 different countries around the world in every state in the US. You see this spread of the maker's movement. It's all about people going back and looking to have things handmade, things that are crafted, back in their life because I think that makes you a healthier person to be surrounded by something that someone else made with blood, sweat, and tears. And so being able to start producing beer glasses and get them in hands of people I know and then eventually being able to get my work in the hands of people that I'd never met before, that's a rewarding thing. Like even to this day whenever somebody orders a glass off Etsy and gets it and they send me an email and like, hey I just wanted to let you know that I use this every day, it's my favorite glass. Thank you. You know, that makes my day. Craft beer is about adventure. It's, like, it's about exploration. And there's a whole culture of people that do that, where they don't want to just go and have the same beer every time. They want to try something new, and they want to sit and talk about it. In pretentious beer, we've got no TVs. Sure. The only entertainment is the beer in front of you and the person beside you. Drinking really good beer and having great conversation and connecting with other people. And everybody's hanging out, enjoying the beautiful beer and talking about it. So this is the American Wheat. It goes like hard, banana. Tennesseans can get a real authentic German beer without a passport. Nico Schultz and his family have brought us traditional beer recipes made the German way. From the unique castle entrance to the beer hall and garden, Schultz Brow will transport you and your taste buds to Germany. I think what really makes Schultz Brow special is the tradition behind our beer. If you come here, our goal is to really make you feel like you're actually taking a little trip in time or you're actually traveling across the ocean and actually ending up in Germany. So we built the place kind of like a castle, so you walk in through a big entrance tower and you end up in a big beer hall. And we have that very large beer garden outside, which is completely walled in, so you won't see the outside. So you kind of can forget where you are, and that's kind of our goal. So we kind of try to make the tap room match the beers, the traditional old-fashioned style, and just kind of want to make you feel like you're on a little vacation. We founded Schultz Broy in 2014. With Schultz Broy, we basically came up with the name since we always wanted a family business and Schultz is obviously our family name. And Broy is just another German word for, for brew. You know, you go out having beer, you, have a, you go and have a Broy. So it's just, you know, more a slang term for beer. And we just figure that makes a nice connection to, you know, ties in our German tradition already in the word, in the name. Here we just have a few different examples of the different molds. Right here we got We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We focusing on very traditional beer styles. So they're all our own recipes, family recipes, but 
The style itself is really traditional, so all the ingredients we use are actually imported from Germany. And everything we do here is actually brewed according to the Reinheitsgebot, which is a German purity law, which basically is the oldest food safety law in the world, which basically dictates you the only ingredients you can use in beer is malt, hops, yeast and water. So we use no chemicals, no flavor enhancers, no antioxidants, nothing of that kind. We are trying to be very traditional, very basic, because that's all you need for beer. Even by using only those four ingredients, you can really come up with a large variety of beers. Just the malt itself, the way it's roasted in the malt house, it gives you all the different colors, so you can make a really light beer or you can go really dark. Well, when I grew up in Germany, we actually always spent our vacations over here for two or three weeks at a time. And we rented a motorhome and we traveled across the United States. And I just really fell in love with the country, the culture, the people. So I always knew I wanted to move over here one day. I was born near Stuttgart. We moved up north when I was fairly little, so I grew up near Hamburg. And then eventually when I was 21, I moved over here to the United States. I first moved to Lexington, Kentucky for college. I studied food science, and when I moved over here, I didn't really find the beer I you know, used to drink over there. So I ended up brewing my own beer in my apartment during college. Here in the States, I feel like most beers I was exposed to didn't have as much flavor as I was used to. And whenever I found a good imported beer from Germany, it's been sitting on the shelf forever and it just wasn't fresh anymore. It was oxidized and it didn't give you the taste I was used to. So I decided to make my own beer. I happened to find a homebrew kit in the local liquor store and I thought, well, I might as well give it a try. So me and my roommate just went for it and all our friends really loved the turnout of it. We kept brewing and brewing and brewing more and eventually our apartment kind of started to look like a brewery. So I either went to class for food science or I was at home brewing. And since my major was already in the food industry, I figured, you know, I might as well specialize in fermentation and brewing science. My goal to with Schultz Proy Brewing here in Knoxville was to bring people a really authentic German traditional beer. There are lots of other breweries out there making IPAs, but we couldn't really find the traditional German lager. So we wanted to make something that's really approachable, easy drinking, that you can drink in a big liter stein, like you know you see in pictures from Oktoberfest. And you just can drink a lot of it without having too much. We make a large variety of German beers. So we have, you know, on the light side, we have our Munich Helles, which is really light in color. It's really malt based, so it has this little sweetness to it. It's really refreshing. So that's one of the beers you drink in a typical big liter stein. And then it goes darker. We have our Munich Dunkel, which has lots of roasted caramel malts in it. So you get the sweetness from the malt. Our Schwarz beer, which is our darkest beer, it's a black lager. We also like to barrel age it. So that's a nice touch I like to do. I'm a big bourbon drinker myself. We get different bourbon barrels from different distilleries in Kentucky. And we just fill them with our double bog and normally age them for about six to eight months. And that beer, especially the double bog, really picks up that bourbon character and flavor. The longer you keep them in there, the better they get. It is like wine or bourbon. The longer you age it, the better it gets. So all our tables and chairs out in the beer garden have been imported from Germany. Like the benches and tables have actually been used at Oktoberfest and they tend to replace it every year. And all the tables and chairs have been used at local beer gardens. They actually have the name on the back, so you might see Augustina on there or Schneider or different other places. You will find a lot of smaller items that have been in our family for a long time. You will see the pictures my grandpa painted. And you will find the antlers that my grandpa he was a hunter, so he hunted them and shot them, and we have them hanging on the walls. And just part of us trying to make it authentic, you know, giving you the most real feel of being in a true German beer garden. So we are trying to bring the experience over here. Our Oktoberfest is the same times as Munich's. So we actually kicked it off last weekend at 6 a.m. And we actually had 200 people here at 6 a.m. for that to tap it off. So people really like the experience, and I think they're excited who had to have an Oktoberfest here in Knoxville. So what we try to do here at Schulzbräu is when you come in, you will see a really big curved glass wall between the tap room and the production side. So our idea was to have the production exposed. So if you come in, you can see all the tanks, you see us brewing, you see the process vessel pumps running. So you really watch us make the beer while you're over in the tap room enjoying the finished product. I think the beer industry is really booming right now. I think people are realizing beer can actually have a taste to it and there's more than just one or two light varieties. There are just so many different styles and kinds of beer that even somebody who says they normally don't like beer, I would say they just haven't found the right one. 
There's plenty of room for more breweries here in Knoxville. We always like to say the more breweries, the better. It helps bring people in. It helps to get people exposed to craft beers. The beer you're drinking plays a crucial role, but it's certainly the atmosphere where you're at. It's the story behind the place, the people working there. You should definitely explore all the different breweries in your area. We hope you've enjoyed learning more about craft brews, and we hope you can get out and enjoy some of the unique beers in your hometown. I'm Vicki Lawson. See you on the next Tennessee Live. Tennessee Life is sponsored by Mint South Sewing and Fabric has what you need for your creative adventure. If it's sewing, embroidery, or vinyl projects you need for a home business, Etsy, Pinterest, and your family, we have it. Mint South Sewing sells Brothers Sewing and Embroidery Machines and the latest Scan and Cut Crafting Machine. Mint South Sewing and Fabric in the Gallery Shopping Center. Tennessee Life is also brought to you by Next to New, an upscale consignment shop serving Knoxville next to new Knox.com and by the flower pot for over 100 years offering flowers and same day delivery with two convenient Knoxville locations KnoxvilleFlowerPot.com and by viewers like you thank you a DVD of this program is available by visiting East Tennessee PBS.org